welcome back for another episode of our podcast. And today we've got Michelle Treville from One Card. I will go right into it and Michelle hand it over to you. Who are you? What do you do? And why do you do it? Gosh, right. So I'm Michelle from One Cards. We are a digital business card platform. Now we say it's more than a digital business card. It is a card to do business with. You see, it's packed full of useful features for any business to connect quickly and easily globally. Um, and why do I do it? Um, well, it's been a, an interesting journey that's led to the point that we are at here. Um, and I, I guess, you know, for that thing, to strive to do something, to do something different, to achieve something. Um, you know, we've done lots of things along the, the pathway to get us to this point, um, but we find ourselves in a very exciting environment, which is one card that's uh, leading us to lots of connections, which is why me and you are sat here talking today. Um, yeah. <laughs> so why, what, what, before this, what were you doing before you started one card? Um, Good, way back when. So my, my background is, before the kids and all that, is um, I was in electrical retail for years. From the shop floor up, um, became uh, area manager down in the south. Um, and then that moved on to, I mean, I do, I've always had a love of retail because, it, you know, from, from doing that, then having the kids, I couldn't live out of a suitcase any longer. You know, I used to travel up and down the country and everything. Um, my husband and business partner, he's a senior project manager for blue chip companies globally, and he's also a bit of a, a cricketer, club cricketer. So we decided to combine my retail knowledge and his love of cricket, and we opened our own cricket specialist store on the high street. Um, yeah, so this is where the journey of our entrepreneurship, if you like, started. Um, but we didn't just want to be just your average Joe shop we became a experience store. So this was a high street shop that had a full blown cricket net inside. So you could come in, try out the equipment. We run kids' birthdays parties. We had a network of coaches. So we actually work, went into schools and did delivered coaching programs. Um, we identified a bit of a gap in terms of, so we helped cricket uh, clubs recruit. So they'd come to the shop for the experience, buy the equipment. We'd try and get kids into cricket from a really young age and pass them back to the clubs. So it was very much a business, but community led as well. Um, yeah. Wow, that, that is very cool. Carry on. <laughs> oh, no, I honestly on didn't know that. Um, and then really what, what moved us on to being where we are today is, you know, that that was amazing and we it was just it was such an experience our own kids were very little i mean we started that i was getting in touch with suppliers to try and get involved with them when my little girl was nine months old wriggling at the side of me making all them you know phone calls and everything to set everything up um so it's quite a journey and they they all the kids came with us on events you know we used to go to big country fairs and to showcase the business at the same time um so it was full on 24 7. um and we became like the third largest independent retailer in the UK. So um, wow. it was exciting times, really. But when we started looking at that, you know, Mark was still doing his project management, working a lot, a lot of hours. And from a business perspective, as good as it was, we used to have to invest in a lot of stock. I mean, some of these cricket bats then were like five, six hundred pounds sat on a shelf. And so you had to hope mm -hmm. that that was going to sell through the summer. And of course, we're in England, yeah? So you have you have some rain, it wipes out your business. So yeah, we had exactly. a lot of challenges <laughs> with that. And um, and while, while all that was happening, we, we branched out into teamwear. So we used to do cricket teamwear, you know, all your clothing. We brought it in-house to increase our margins. Um, and then we started getting asked for business clothing and branding at the same time. So as we looked at the how the business was, the cricket side, really equipment, etc., wasn't very pro you know profitable. But the clothing side yeah. was beginning to be profitable and very easy. You ordered, you produced, it went out. So um, we had a little bit of a health scare, nothing serious with Mark. So we just decided to look at everything, right? Let's just strip everything back and just flip everything on its head. And we went into branding 
So um, quite a change. So we closed the cricket down, went into branding. And then that's where we find ourselves with this. So we started doing, it evolved from clothing to offering full solutions in terms of branding to, you know, expo materials, leaflets, business cards, everything you could possibly want for a business we provided. Um, and mm -hmm. again, Mark was still doing his project management, um, working for Thomas Cook, which didn't end too well. So yep. sat in the news and... Yep, yep, um, yep knew we had to get a bottle of wine out because he wasn't going to carry on the next day. <laughs> I think he got a text okay. saying, yeah, see you, mate. And <laughs> that's how that finished, um, which was fine. We got the branding business, but then we went into a world pandemic. Um, so a double whammy. Uh, but what it did was it made us look at us as a branding business. What do we offer people in terms of connection? in terms of, you know, using these materials to promote your business. And um, mm -hmm. using Mark's technical background, like, right, well, when you look at just business cards in themselves, I give you my paper business card, you disappear with it. I've got no control over that contact from here on in. And then we've yep. all got these, we've all got our mobile phone devices. And the fact is that you actually tap, swipe, use your phone 2,000 times a day. So you go to it for a wow. source of all of your information. So what we started doing is looking at the technology that's out there, which is NFC, which is what we use. It's not new. It's been around for yeah. ages. It's Apple Pay, contactless door systems, lots of applications. So how can we use that, get all of your information into one card, you tap it onto a client's card and transfer all of your business information in one go. Just literally yep. your logo, your business information, your socials, your email, your website, everything saved yep. forever into your client's phone so they can find you quickly and easily when they need to. Yep. You know, you're not a lost bit of paper because that, that's the other fact is even if somebody wanted to keep you, they might put your name and phone number in, they might get a digit wrong. You know, uh, and 80% of those business cards go in the bin. They they disappear whether they want to or not. They might want to keep you and think, oh, I need to contact Shane next week. Where's his business card? I don't know where it is. Whereas this ensures that you're there ready for when they want to contact you. And then we've got lots of other features now that, um, that work. So, so, yeah, so that's the long and short of this whole story, a bit of from cricket to digital business. That's amazing. That's amazing. So even here, right, mm. here's a bunch of business cards that I have that, again, in two years, I've not actually called any of them. <laughs> and then, uh, just like you said, uh, I've got, what, we, me and you met last September, yeah. I think it was, or something around there. And uh, I've got, what, 16 business cards in there that I've not called one of them. And again, yours is the only one that I have gone around. And when I'm in Uber and people are like, what do you do? So you do this? Oh, my God, you did this. And I say, yeah, go on, tap this on your phone. And some, some of the Indian ones and like the foreigners, they're scared. They're like, this is my data. Yeah. But then the ones who know it, they tap it and they're like, oh, my God, this is so cool. Now, the reason why I wanted to dive back mm -hmm. so far, like, what, what year were, were you in uh, retail sales before you had What, what, sorry? What year were what year was it when I you were stra in straight in out of doing my air levels? So I was doing that while I was doing my air levels. So what's that? Ninety three from yeah. So that is where I believe that's where like the the punch of our, of my podcast comes in. The amount of change and how things pivot along those decades, even for me, I've been through two decades of iterations to get where mm -hmm. I am today. And I'm thirty seven years old. I started when I was what seventeen. And I've, in 93, I was actually in Saudi Arabia with my dad and my, my mom and dad. We were living out there for uh, an expat job. Um, but how your business has gone from sales, which is definitely the pinnacle point, and then it went through specialist cricket supplies and then becoming the third largest independent retailer in the UK, which is a mm. huge spike. Then it's clothing, then branding, then your husband's transition from like a, a comfortable, yeah. secure yeah. job, which is what everybody does not understand is not really yeah. so secure. And then you moved into this, which 
now becomes this very cool technology. It's very different and it is very fast. So I use it myself. I'm not working with you guys or anything, but I tap the, phone, the card on the phone. All my stuff comes up. I have socials galore or YouTube, TikTok. It has all of those. And I'm able to present myself in a very, very unique way now. And um, that's quite powerful. So when did you discover that you had a spark for sales, <laughs> entrepreneurship, uh, barring the pandemic? What was that spark that like really came out inside you? Um, when was that? Do you know what? So like sales never came natural to me at all, in, even in my early retail days. I was mm -hmm. a very, believe it or not, I was quite introvert and very shy when I was younger. Um, and okay. But there was just something there. I just liked the connection with people. And, you know, I got my first manager's job. I was kind of thrust into that. There was a, a store came open and I was 21 and they said, right, go and get involved. Actually, people thought I was going to fail and I didn't. I smashed I smashed I all that. targets and then they promoted me to my own store rather than just a desert store. I was one of the first female managers in the business. Um, and I just, I don't know, I just loved that, the connection with people and being able to solve a problem for them, um, you know, finding out what they need, all the, all those things, matching their needs. And, um, and I just liked achieving, not for, it was never for the money. You know, I had other managers that were all like, you know, money motivated or anything. It wasn't, it was more for the achievement and see what we could do. And and, and that's mm -hmm. where, the, I guess, bringing in the experience store with Cricket was that through my corporate days when I was involved in projects and all about building a customer experience, that's what it's mm -hmm. all about. And I think a lot of that is what we're missing now on the high street and the, the retailers and stuff. That, And that's what this is about. You know, we're, we're, what we look at with, with one card is it's all about the customer experience. What value can we give you? What are you going to use out of this tool that's going to be, you know, uber useful in ev your everyday business life? So we're constantly looking at, you know, we've developed it, the features that we've got now. You can book meetings through it, share documents. We can help businesses go paperless. So we're constantly looking at what is the customer experience and how can we add even more value to it? And that's mm -hmm. not mm -hmm. as that, I, I suppose that in those days of what can we create, being creative is um, about the customer retention, isn't it? So if you're standing out against your competition with that. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And customer experience is a huge thing because the first, the first seconds of your interactions, they say, is where you either make it or break it with a customer. So I don't know if you've read uh, the book by Chris Voss. He was, um, what's the name of the book? Let me get it. So just like that. Like Chris Voss's this. book. <laughs> so Chris Voss, okay, that's what it was called. It's called Never Split the Difference. Let me just grab one thing. Sorry. It's called Never Split the yeah. Difference, right? And Chris Voss is a hostage FBI. He's the lead hostage negotiator for the FBI. And who better to tell you how to negotiate about to give you a life sentence. So if you're robbing a bank and you, uh, if you have what, 10 hostages inside and the police are outside and FBI swap and the entire task force is ready to either kill you or <laughs> yeah. get you out of there and an annihilate you, Chris Voss has to stay on that phone and say, hey, like, I'm about to barter with your with the person's life, just yeah. severe. And on top of that bargain, I'm going to tell you a deal or give you a deal on whether you're going to come out alive or in a body bag. So yeah. who better to learn from, right? And they did studies <laughs> and research for years on how a conversation is developed and how trust is developed. So you typically have 27 seconds to engage a new prospect or engage a new person. The first seven seconds where you is where you establish that trust, whether it's me in front of you and saying, hi, how are you? The tonality of my voice, the calmness, the vibrations, the frequencies, all of that will determine how you resonate with me and vice versa. And then uh -huh. from there, you open up another window, which is the 20 seconds of second phase trust. 
And then from that is where the person will determine, do I want to continue my conversations with this person or not? And through these experiences is how I learned about the first elements of a customer experience. And even getting, I'll give you an example, right? Here's a business card I've got here from somebody who was at a supermarket and they do um, like dragon sculpted glass oh, yeah. trays and stuff. Nothing bad, but this business card is trash, <laughs> right? It's absolute garbage. And I won't use that. But again, the quality and the feel of one card, which is it has my logo, it has my name, it has the QR code. It has that different feeling. And I think people are underestimating the value of those first couple seconds mm. or that first introduction because they're so focused on just getting money that yeah. they're losing all the facts that this person is actually a person, there's a human being on the other side of this. So I realized all of this when I was having challenges when I was working in a corporate job from 2015 to 2018, I was very good, but there became there came a time when there was a short plateau and I was unable to convert my conversations into deal flow or sales process. Yeah. Now, through cold calling and then learning and education, I was able to get through that. But that challenge allowed me to go to the next level. So mm -hmm. for you, what was the biggest challenge? Let's say in the midst that whether it was in retail sales, owning the cricket shop, branding, or even going through to building one card. What was the first major challenge that you had that like helped you pivot or go to the next stage of growth? Oh gosh. Do you know what? There's been so many. Name there one. Was... You can only pick one. Uh, one. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. It's gotta be managing on a minuscule budget, yeah. Yep. So especially when you first start out, even back in the cricket days. When you start in, you know, starting something new, you know, it's I can't remember what which um, who it was. They were talking about they were selling bras. I don't know if it was Wonder Bra, or it was something like that. But I remember back in like the cricket days, I'm like, God, how can we reach more people? We've not got an endless pot of money, but we know we've got something different, something great. Like which, like we have with one card now. How can we reach people and be different? And I remember watching this. I can't remember who it was, but. And she said what they did was that so they were selling these wonder bras and they literally started like marching outside of clinics saying you don't need to get plastic surgery you just need to get these one and she'd got like no money in the bank but a sale started rocketing so i'm like right i've got to do something like that with <laughs> okay <laughs> with the bras but you but the creativity yep. so i think that's when yeah i'm in control here how can i be creative and try and approach things differently mm -hmm. rather than like, oh, nobody's phoning. <laughs> you know, you can't <laughs> you can do that. You've got to go out and get it. If something's not working, you've got to switch to something else. What well, you know, so I suppose it was that um not even when things are good, those sitting on your laurels, what can we do differently? How can we keep going to to switch it up? I suppose that's the the, the biggest learning and and the biggest thrill I think as well is yeah, that right. we're creative, aren't we? If you but you know without your thoughts and your mind putting us in this situation right now for your podcast, you you're the creator of that. I'm the creator. But I just think that's quite um you know when they say thoughts become things, but that's you can create it's it. Very if it's very true. It's very true. And like I said, it all it always comes from like. A life lesson in and, and whether that's good or bad something happens along the way you're you, you, the way it, however you want to see it in perspective i've always seen it as life will go very very smoothly and then some major roadblock or train will just fucking plow you in the face <laughs> right and through that you can say oh that hurt and i'm bruised and start crying about it and be this victim <laughs> or you can say all right i've got a few scratches let me go sidestep and keep going and that's mm -hmm. always what I've done. But then there's also times where you can't sidestep and you're mm -hmm. actually trapped and you have to figure out, can I build myself a ladder and climb over this thing? And you start to develop those things, but they always come from the challenges. So if you could identify, pinpoint a specific challenge, a moment in your life where you was in this phase and let's just say, all right, I'm man managing a budget with the cricket shop 
was there a time where maybe you were at zero or you were below zero in debt and you really had to get it like was there any ever a moment like that well, well we closed cricket we could for that you know it wasn't going right it was all going and um one of the biggest learnings from that was uh, i think my heart was too much in it you know we'd built this thing from scratch yeah. and we loved it right from the creation of the name and everything it was pinnacle of the community and for a long time i was embarrassed that it didn't work how i wanted it to work you know but now okay. i'm not because on reflection i'm like i know it taught me everything that what we're doing now it's it was the lessons mm -hmm. you know all the things when you watch you know stephen bartlett and everybody talks about that failure is not failure you're just learning something and so i'm proud of what we went through now um you know it and and a legacy now we've still got local people that still bring up of those course. days and that's the thing. Like, wow i created that brand and people still remember that like eight years nine years on that's the point um, that is exactly the point though that is the point and that's what i try to highlight here that the journey that people see like this this aftermath which is the face of what one card is today and you're very well polished now you look at, like everything looks very good but nobody sees what's under the iceberg and what was built, like how much resilience you built up, all the things you, that you had to go through. But you've said it here, and I think this is a major thing. I had to know when to hang it up to. Like mm. it was 2023 last year. Um, I got to the point where I was running a business. We hit a half a million in two years. We went from zero to 200K to 500K and was on track to 800,000 pounds, if not a million in that in 2023. And the biggest shitstorm of my life happened, right? Mm. A divorce, a separation, my business partner, stuff with him, uh, some of the team, they just started to flatline. And it was, again, a CEO, found a, situ found a CEO situation, driving the company. And it came to a point where do I pay for people's salaries to sit around and do nothing? Mm. Or do I say this is now a business that is no longer sustainable yeah. and I have to change? Now, people have a very big attachment, like you said, mm -hmm. to the current situation and the embarrassment of failure when they don't understand it's failing forward, it's accelerated learning. Mm -hmm. When, like, what feelings do you get? When do you know that, all right, like, I really have to pivot right now? Oh. Well, that's the tricky one, isn't it? Because it's easy in hindsight. It's easy to look back and say, oh, what, we should have done it sooner. Yep. That, that's the easy thing. Uh, do you know what? I don't know. I think I think um, the difference now is like that, you know, surrounding yourself with good people. Well, I'll, I'll tell you this, right? So the reason I'm going to stop you there for, that, for this yeah. reason. There's somebody out there who's you 20 years ago. Yeah. And they might be in a situation where they're in retail sales and they're in mm -hmm. their, their second or third year and they're watching this because they're looking for someone like you, exactly, exactly who you are, exactly what you've achieved. And they need they, they're holding on to something that is their baby right now, but it's failing. Right. It might it might look like it's going good, but it's actually failing. And they need to hear from someone like you because you've walked that walk. I'm not walking it. Yeah. When is that point? Like, how? What is the feeling you get? What are what are the signs around you that say, "Look, now it's time to pivot. It's time to change. Either realize, test this, and look at it this way, yeah. or go this way because this is this is happening here." Walk me through that so that person can get that kind of split lesson, that masterclass in one minute with you here. I guess you, it, I guess it is that you have to somehow detach yourself from the heartfelt to the decision making exactly you know? yep so um uh i've just do you know what i've just been in a coaching lesson this morning and he, <laughs> he, walked, he walked through that exact process of this is how you make a decision yeah and it was that is like you know we're taking a look at um looking at the facts so you start with the facts of right mm -hmm. so what is it working are you making money what is affecting that yeah you know have we got longevity can it can it be changed is there something that you can add to it to mm -hmm. you know, maybe you need just some more sales maybe you need to employ the right person what can that happen or is it actually 
you've got to look at that and say, no, it's not. But like what we did with the cricket situation was, right, well, that section's not working. It's eating the money. This section is. So let's flip that and look at what can move us forward. So that was the, you know, so it's kind of taking a, a overview of it mm-hmm. and, yeah, removing your heart from the situation. I think least. that's absolute gold, right? It really is because even for me, like, removing your heart from the situation, <laughs> it's really, it, re- it really is important because that's what it was for me. Like, as much as I could say um, – everybody's like oh yeah we don't have runway anymore and I was like I'm gonna make it work what I will make it work and I did and I did and again and again and again and again and I was able to carry on my thesis for for long enough but it came to a point like like you said it was eating money and as much as I could go to HMRC and say hey I want to close this company down that was my bait that was my first it's still running today it's actually this year without people is the most (laughs) profitable year (laughs) <laughs> I'm like Jesus Christ and that was because people were eating money so I'm very different lots of companies like I'm, I'm I have no shame in my game of saying it I fucking hated managing people it's a pain <laughs> in the <laughs> ass it's such a pain in the ass people are so difficult even me I would hate to manage me I know it right I'd be an absolute I am a nightmare to manage so I've already heard it so I've been through those low points right and again it's about re- that leads us on to the next point, which is resilience. Okay. And the only way I've been resilient and every single one of the 200 plus CEOs now that I've had the benefit of interviewing on my podcast, all have some form of incredible resilience. Mm. Incredible. They go through these situations, they get battered and they get chucked on the floor and kicked around and they still get up and do it. And they still get up and do it again. And there's not many people like that. There's a very small selective group of characters, of individuals that can build enough resilience to keep going. How have you built up your resilience? Like, what is it that you've done to build up such thick skin in such a tough world? (laughs) Thick skin. Um, Right. So I have had to work a lot on this, a lot. And I think that's, that's, that is it you have to work on yourself so that's absolutely like this is loaded with audio books and i can turn to it when i need it so right i need to listen to this right now um you know where can you get that inspiration the help you've got to um like you were saying you've got to kind of train your mind to think differently to get over those things otherwise you'll just be a blithering mess in the corner somewhere like you haven't you uh, what what can i learn who can i learn from if it is from podcasts from something else what can i take from this to move on and it you know you never stop learning you've always got to there's always something you can be better in doing constantly and i think um you know like you were saying just then looking back at yourself 20 years ago and you kind of mentally do that i'm like oh god even like five years ago wow I was such a different person. Five years ago, my face was so much skinnier. <laughs> <laughs> I saw a video, right? I was watching these videos and I was like, oh my God. So I'm in I'm in a much smaller apartment and my face is so much skinnier. My neck is skinnier. I don't have two chins. I'm like, oh my God, I gotta lose some weight. And then but then again, like in terms of just confidence and personal development and like simple things so i'll ask you very quickly on personal development and in in relation to podcasting and audiobooks name me the number one audiobook you have on your phone that's your favorite favorite to date only one only oh, one um right i guess actually it's a really simple one there's mel robbins the five second rule Perfect. right tell me about that, that. that can absolutely help you with everything you ever do right okay. so it's just it's it's all about the premise of just not overthinking anything don't overthink anything right and that could love be that from, from getting up in the morning you know like sit hitting the snooze button no lay in bed just go five four three two one you're up you're at it yeah oh i don't i don't want to go to the gym because oh i'm tired whatever no get your clothes on five four three two one do it 
cold calling. Oh, I'm not sure. Oh, this person's not going to answer. And all these things are going through your mind, talking mm-hmm. you out of situations all mm-hmm. the time. Just you talk the five, four, three, two, one, do it. So I love that. The five second rule, it's genius for me because you can literally apply it to every single part of your working, well, every everyday life in everything. I and um, that was um, just a, a really, you know, I think it started for that because I needed to get my ass out and go to the gym, you know. <laughs> so, <laughs> but I need to start listening to it again. Yeah. But but um, but yeah, all oh, the all those things you don't want to do, just the difficult conversations, the whatever it is, just five, four, three, two, one, do it. I agree with that a lot, and I think that I wish I wish I had that book. I've heard about it before, actually. I wish I had that book when I was. Um, <laughs> A business owner with my business partner because it used to take him about 24 hours to come uh, <laughs> to terms with his thinking so if I had that wow that would have been a big difference now in this t- in sense of podcasting for me honestly in the past two years I do this I absorb podcasts twice as fast as anybody and anybody that is around me and I know I know why is because I listen to it on two times the speed so I oh, changed yeah, yeah. my settings one on a one hour, like typically they're one to two hour podcasts, um, very high focused business, business podcast. So I'm at a stage where I've surpassed my million pound revenue target. And my next goal is eight to nine figures. And those are typically hundred million dollar um, owners or business owners or businesses. And now I watch those podcasts from people who have walked the walk and talked the talk. Um, and they are they've exited their companies for two to three hundred million, six hundred million, right? These are huge numbers. And these people are giving like first hand advice into how to build a business, how to get your first hundred customers, how to build the right tech, what kind of ideas to have, uh, how to plan your projects, what kind of development, to, like all kinds of stuff. And it's right there in front of you. Podcasting mm. has really, this is why I do it, because so many of my learnings have come from this. Yeah. I didn't go to college, but I know that I'm smarter and I can execute 10 times better than an MBA Harvard graduate. And that's mm-hmm. a fact. So when it comes to podcasting, who's your go-to source for a podcast? F- very famous, very established. Uh, I Somebody suppose, you know, everybody kind of says it, but Stephen Bartlett, you know. Yeah. It kind of goes without saying, doesn't it? Really? Oh my God, um, he's incredible. And I think, again, one thing that's really, really, I've studied Stephen's, um, his podcast a lot. And what yeah. helps his podcast become so viral is his thumbnails. So did you know that? No. Okay, so now think <laughs> about it. Before you know who Stephen Barlet is from speaking to people, you have to come across his profile or you yeah. have to be on your YouTube scrolling for content yeah. and the picture that you see of the guest or the title will be a black background, white writing. The focus point of the podcast is in red. The one word is in red. And then it has Steven's picture for social proof, right? But the tagline is what draws somebody in. Yeah. And without you knowing mm-hmm. that the thumbnail is what draws the viewer into watching content, that's how it comes, unless it's word of mouth. Unless, right? yeah. yeah. That's where podcasting becomes so valuable is because, yeah, as much as me and you speaking can give a ton of high-level content, how do you draw those people in? How mm-hmm. does it first get to his first 100 million people that watch his podcast, right? Those are huge factors that play into this. So... One of the things that helped his podcast become so big is the community of people he mm-hmm. put around him, right? And again, something you've seen even from me and how we met is from uh, the HPBA community. Now, I'm building my community based on there's this massive shift right now in AI and AI adoption with technology and how people are leveraging it. A lot of people are getting sold to. A lot of people are being puked on with this garbage we've got ai this ai this but all it is is they put ai in the beginning of it which is just the chat gpt api and it says can you um 
can you identify or help me find out this message in a clearer way? And then that goes into the next part and the rest is just standard technology. For you though, what is your belief system in the adoption or the joining or the belief of community as, mm. as a channel of marketing over the next four to five years? What, where do I see it going? Yeah. What, you, ha, well, what, just, yeah. I mean, but well, for me, community is everything from, from even from the early days for, because, you know, back in those first days, social media was very different, mm. although it was there, it was very different. So we, we built, that was a, a local business. So we built a massive local community and got, in, you know, in that, but now we can do it all online, which, you know, we're in an amazing world, aren't we? We yeah. can connect everywhere. And, um, you know, anybody starting out now, the, you've got the world at your fingertips, really, if you can get to get through the mess and <laughs> some of the rubbish out there and, and focus. But I think um, it is everything. It's everything from in person. It's all about building relationships. I mean, that's everything that we're about as well. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. where the whole premise of One Card is, is yep. about connecting more effectively, but building the relationships being authentic, being in the right space as well. Not every community is right for you, finding the right one for you as well. And I guess that's that's one of my things, you know, find your tribe because they're gonna be the ones that help you, that champion you, um, you know, with your brand and you helping them as well. So it's all, it works both ways. So that community for me, it's not, it's not about taking, it's not about getting from it. It's about what can you contribute to it and what, you know, can you do together? Yeah. And I think it is, it's, it's, it is very different. I think so much of it has become such a trans. It went from the beginning of what I knew my dad to do. He was at Goldman Sachs, loads of very, very like well-known, well-known banks, private wealth banks, investment mm -hmm. banks. And it's always been about relationships. And then it came a time where the internet came out and is very transactional. And, after it being so transactional, people are now going back to the fundamentals and you've got to filter out a lot of the rubbish. So how are you filtering out the rubbish or the crap that comes into some of these communities? I just think it becomes really transparent. I think, you, you know, if you know what, what your values are and you suddenly find yourself in the wrong space, it's just really obvious. Yeah. So you either remove yourself from that space or same as if you're in a good space and somebody pops in like they did, right? At yeah, <laughs> my one had to get the boot. Jesus yeah. Christ. <laughs> what the hell's I won't come back. Yeah. What? <laughs> <laughs> For 150 bucks? I was like, at least put a good fucking price in there. <laughs> So it's either they come in and do that or, you know, it is in a room full of people and that person's not right for that space. They suddenly look, you know, everybody's like, oh. Mm -hmm. so, <laughs> so I think it just, the, if if you're not, if you're not true to yourself and true to your branding and everything that you're about, it you suddenly become very transparent that it's, you know, not you're not you. right for that. Yeah. So two questions that while, while, while we approach the top of the hour. What do you say for somebody who is in a job, in a corporate job, a retail job, a high street job, they are considering, hmm, I'd like to be like that woman, Michelle, and I'd like to run a business <laughs> with my husband. And I would like, I, like, I find it extremely inspirational and like amazing that you're able to do it with like the entire family went along on the journey with you. Like, I would have loved that too. So what is the roadmap to success in 2024 in a very short snapshot? What would you say? What In a very easy fundamental way, what would you say it is? What, what is my, what? Your roadmap to success that you would give to somebody listening today. Um, right, well, do your homework, get ready for the work. Okay. You don't leave, you don't leave the job for an easy life. But you leave it for choices. You, it gives you choices. Um, but you've. But there's also you still have those moments where you know you've got to get on with other things. There's still stuff you don't want to do when you can't just hand it over to a personnel department. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yep. You know. So you and and just be ready for learning constantly and learning things that you didn't think you were ever going to be able to 
do. There's no more, you know, oh, I don't need to know that. Well, if you do, if you're, if you're not good at marketing and you don't like marketing, it's tough shit. You've got to learn it and get, um, find a way of 100%. doing it. There's lots of elements throughout the business that you you know you might not be good at, but you're going to have to learn it. So yeah, absolutely right. you know, get ready for the hard work, but then it can be really rewarding. You know, people you meet, places you get to see if you put yourself out there. Um, it, we've got some amazing experiences coming. We've just had some amazing experiences. You know, we've been to Hungary with HBBA. Mm. We was in Parliament a few weeks ago. That you know the opportunities that come if you surround yourself with the right people. Absolutely. So, in ten years from now, which is the, always the best question that I have for everybody, some or a lot of people ask who or what would you say to yourself 10 years ago if you could wave a wave a magic wand and i think that's just like the past is the past is finished but you can create your future so as of today it's 5 50 it is the 21st of february so on the 21st of february 2034 today you're sitting in front of me and we're having a nice chat over a podcast and then you've got other things to do this evening what are you doing at the same time 10 years from today at this exact moment these palm trees behind me <laughs> <laughs> you know, so what country um, are those palm trees in oh gosh it's got to be malaysia okay uh, yeah definitely definitely why uh, malaysia Oh, I just love it out there. We went to Borneo before COVID with the family and just, oh, it's just the most amazing place out there. Kuala Lumpur, it's, you know, the the life, the people, it, yeah. That's um, it? Yeah, pardon? Is that, so that's the place, Malaysia? Are you, oh, yeah, yeah, definitely. Have you sold one card? Is it still going? Is Are the kids running it? Are Somebody you... else can be doing that, absolutely. I, but that's the beauty of this. I'm, oh, you know, we're building something that can be done from anywhere in the world. So whether we're still doing it or we've moved on from that, you know, the kids are still very much involved with yeah. Ethan 16. He comes with us to all the expos at Excel in London and he's our superstar salesperson at that age is incredible. Our our big girl who's 24, she's our voiceover because she's a bit of an actress on our with promo <laughs> videos. Yeah. Uh, you know, so so but yeah, the future is is that that this, you know, I'm doing this for the freedom. Mm -hmm. I'm doing it for the freedom. And it this the roadmap continues where we want it to go, then it's gonna give us all of those things. Wow. So well, I think that's an amazing way to wrap it up. So if anybody <laughs> wants to find out more about one card. Where do they come to have that conversation? Where are you most present today? So you can find us on uh, LinkedIn. We're on all your socials, Instagram, Facebook, and of course our website, um, which is onecards with an S dot co dot UK. Um, you can book in there for demonstrations so you can find out exactly what one card could do for your business, whether you're a single business owner, whether you're a corporate with a hundred staff um you know come on have a look see what difference it can make for your business because we're you know we're helping businesses go paperless we're saving them a ton of money but also the productivity and the sales and the leads just um you know will increase <laughs> well that's a good way to i think that's a great way to wrap it up so look michelle thank you very very much for being our lovely guest today what will happen is all of the links and everything that you've just shared we'll put that in like the summary on, below then we have a bunch of content that's going to be going out across all of our socials so people will be able to know a lot more about you after this until next time we shall see you again so thank you very much yeah hope to see you soon shane thank you for having me it's been no amazing thank you. wait <laughs> for a second then let me just stop it and then it will finish the upload